Hello and welcome back to EsmaConf 2023. This is the fifth presentation session of EsmaConf, focusing on quantitative synthesis part two. As always, you can ask questions via Twitter by following at ESHackathon or by using Slack if you've registered for the conference. Presenters will be online uh, during this session and after to answer your questions. So do keep those questions coming in. So our first session today is by Daniel Heck, who's going to be introducing Meta BMA, Bayesian Model Averaging for Meta-Analysis in R. Over to you, Daniel. Yeah, hello. My name is Daniel Heck from the University of Marburg. And today I will present the R package Meta BMA, which can be used to perform Bayesian model averaging for meta analysis. And the example here concerns the effectiveness of descriptive social norms. And more specifically, the question um, how we can make hotel guests reuse their towels. And the control group, um, the hotel guests were simply told, please reuse your towels because it's good for the environment. And the treatment group, they were told that actually a majority of guests reuses their towels. And the effect size here in seven studies was quantified by log odds ratios on the x-axis. And positive values mean that the treatment was um, effective, so that actually the descriptive social norms um, increased the reusage of towels. And the question we have now is how can we aggregate the results here from the seven studies? And in meta-analysis, there are two standard models which are commonly used. The fixed effects model assumes that each study has the same constant true effect size, mu, and that this effect size is identical in all studies. The random effects model, in contrast, assumes that each study has a different effect, theta i, which um, varies according to a normal distribution across studies. So first, the, the studies are sampled essentially from the normal distribution as shown on the right-hand side, and the parameters of this distribution are mu, the average effect size, and tau, the standard deviation of effect sizes. And this tau is also known as the heterogeneity, um, it's the amount of differences of effect sizes across studies. Now the question of interest um, are twofold. First, we are interested in the question whether there is an effect, so whether the overall effect mu differs from zero. And the second question concerns heterogeneity, specifically is the heterogeneity, so is tau larger than zero. And if you combine these two aspects into models, you get four different models, which are denoted here by an H for hypothesis, H0 is um, the null hypothesis and H1 the alternative, and the F is for fixed and the R for random. And then you get the four models where you assume either the effect is zero or not, and second, the um, heterogeneity is zero or not. And the question is obviously, which model should we pick? If we select one of the four models, we ignore uncertainty which of the four models is the correct one. And so it might be better to actually consider the uncertainty which is the best model. And exactly this is done by Bayesian model averaging. So first you have to define prior model probabilities, which is a question, how plausible is each of the four models before you see the data? And here you see an illustration where there are uniform priors used. So uh, on the top, there are these four boxes for the four hypotheses, and each has a probability of 25%. What follows from this is on the bottom, on the left and right hand side, um, the plausibility of our questions. First, is there an effect? Hmm. If you combine the null models and the alternative models, you see it's 50-50. We don't know yet. This is why we do the meta-analysis. On the right-hand side, you see the heterogeneity, and there you also combine models, but on the left-hand side, the fixed ones, and the right-hand side, the random ones. And here it's also 50-50. Now, if you collect data, the probabilities are updated. So we now have posterior model probabilities, and these are determined essentially by the data we collect. These inform the estimation by the prior model, model probabilities, and as we will see later, by the prior distributions on the parameters mu and tau. Now, what happens is here that um, the models under the alternative become more plausible. They have larger posterior probabilities as indicated by probabilities of 40% and 35%. And if you now ask, is there an effect, then their combined probability is 75% compared to only 25% for the null models. This indicates some evidence that there might be an effect. 
while you consider uncertainty um, whether um, effects vary across studies. And the same can be done on the right-hand side for heterogeneity. And this is what the inclusion base factor quantifies. How much evidence is there for a non-zero effect, so whether mu is different from zero. And this is done by comparing two models, the alternative models against um, two null models, um, and thereby we account for the uncertainty should we assume fixed or random effects. And the same you can do for the heterogeneity, just that you bundle together different models. So here you compare uh, the random effects models against the two fixed effects models. However, um, this only works in a Bayesian framework if you assume prior distributions. And specifically, this means you need to make assumptions what size of effect do you expect and how much heterogeneity do you expect. And here these prior distributions are illustrated for the fixed effects models. So you see on the right hand side two plots where there's just a point mass at zero. So essentially the fixed effects models assume there is no heterogeneity at zero. On the left hand side um, it differs between the null and the alternative model whether you assume an effect. The null model assumes no effect and the alternative assumes that the effect is likely between minus two and two with higher probabilities assigned to smaller effect sizes. And now I switch to the random effects model and you see on the right hand side now a prior distribution on the heterogeneity tau on the standard deviation of effect sizes. And this here is a default prior used and based on a literature review. Now what are the basic functions of the package? You can specify priors, you can fit models, you can average across the models and you can compute these inclusion base factors I mentioned before. These are essentially the components I mentioned already and all of these four steps are combined in a single function called MetaBMA and here you see how this is called. Essentially, you have four lines where you specify the input. This is a standard input for meter analysis, as you would also do in other packages. And then you have to specify a prior for the overall effect size here. And here you see it's a normal distribution with mean zero and standard deviation 0.3, uh, truncated at zero. And uh, on the bottom, you see the prior for the heterogeneity. The output is rather large. There's a, a separate tutorial video that explains all of this, but essentially you get base factors, you get model averaged um, results, posterior probabilities, and estimates for the parameters. The plotting functions are um, very helpful because they show what happens here. Essentially, you have a posterior for the fixed effects model, which is violet, a posterior for the random effects model, which is dotted and red, and the model averaged one is in between. It's a blue one, which is kind of a combination of these two, and how far they are combined depends on the posterior probabilities of the models. Here you see also a forest plot where you have the descriptive effects as circles and as triangles the shrinked um, estimates for the studies and you see that there's quite some shrinkage going on so the model um, estimates that the effects are rather similar even though descriptively the effects uh, vary much more. On the bottom you also see the three estimates fixed effects random effects and the averaged one which is a combination of both. So what are the benefits of this approach? I think it's very nice because it's principled, the assumptions are very transparent, and we consider the uncertainty regarding auxiliary assumptions. Um, and you can do it sequentially. So you can continuously update your beliefs as more studies are published. This is shown here. So on the x-axis you accumulate studies, you can update your meta-analysis, and this is what usually happens is that uh, more and more studies come in. However, it could be criticized that we consider the fixed effects model at all. Um, however, this is a plausible model. Um, for instance, if you perform direct replications, there's some evidence that this model is supported. And only, also, if you only have few studies, you might not have sufficient evidence to, for heterogeneity. It might be better to assume that the effect is identical to get a higher predictive accuracy, which means on the bias variance trade-off, um, that you have less variance in predictions um, and this is beneficial compared to fitting a complex uh, random effects model. And of course there are priors. Um, uh, the question is how to pick these. You could ask experts with prior el elicitation. You could do literature reviews and of course you should perform sensitivity analysis to make sure that um, the results are robust for different priors. And of course it's possible to pre-register the priors.
So thanks for your attention. Thanks to my collaborators at the University of Amsterdam. And if you're interested in these topics, you can look up four main papers at my web page. One, the first concerns the meta Package, meta BMA package itself. The second is a primer on the methodology. There's a tutorial on JS, but you can use these methods in a point and click interface. And also we applied these methods to a set of pre-registered re pre replications. So thanks a lot and uh, see you around. Thanks so much, Daniel. Up next, we have Jens Funderich, who's going to be introducing Metapipe X, data analysis and harmonization for multi-lab replications of experimental designs. Yeah, thanks for joining us uh, today, everybody. Um, I'm going to present the Metapub X framework today, um, which is a framework for data analysis and harmonization for multi-lab replications of experimental designs. Um, this will be a more of a brief introduction, how we arrived at the framework, what it is, and how we'd like it to see being used. And um, for a bit more details on how to actually use it, um, please, uh, uh, feel free to attend our tutorial on Friday at this year's EsmaConf as well. So um, where did it start? We were going to uh, reanalyze data from large-scale direct replication projects like the Mendelabs or the Multilab Registered Replication Reports. And um, we intended to use participant or item level data and we needed that data to be cleaned in order to compare reanalyses with already published results. That turned out to be much more difficult than uh, we anticipated. Um, but before I'm going to talk about the difficulties, um, I just want to get uh, some vocabulary out of the way to make sure that we're talking um, about the same things. Um, so this graphic here represents the basic structure of multilabs. And when I say multilabs, I, I just, as I just said, mean like um, the multilab registered replication reports or many labs. Uh, and all of these have a very similar um, structure uh, on, on some level. Um, and the first interpretable data would usually be item level data, um, where each participant uh, is a row and um, each item is still represented as a column. And uh, for individual, individual participant data, uh, these uh, rows are still participants, but now the dependent variable has been aggregated to a single numeric value. And these, again, are aggregated to achieve replication uh, level statistics like between group effect sizes um, um, or group variances. And uh, then those replication statistics are um, used to run meta-analyses to aggregate data for each replication project. And finally, a multi-lab then uh, might, uh, might span multiple of these replication projects. Yeah, but despite uh, the very similar structure, um, the solutions they found uh, to document and analyze their data were rather unique. So just a few examples here. Um, the software in use was usually R, but sometimes SPSS or other software. The code structure itself was very unique to each multi-lab. Um, so when or by whose data aggregated. Sometimes these steps were taken by the replication sites and we don't find the actual raw data. Um, and sometimes that was done at the uh, replication project level. Um, yeah, and the data files themselves are very different. Sometimes CSV files, SPSS files, Excel files, R data, etc. Um, and if you include the files with information for the data transformations, so like uh, inf information that um, the code sources, um, the analysis or data transformation code sources, you will also find solutions like text files or Google documents, um, and probably some more. Um, yeah, so the variation across the multi-labs is quite large. Um, there is little consistency in naming conventions, sometimes the verbal descriptions uh, and other provided details uh, on the data transformations are sparse or even inconsistent. Um, some of the code solutions are really complex, though interesting. Uh, and sometimes we do not find cleaned uh, data sets at uh, different levels of aggregation. Um, so this just results in a lot of detective work for anyone who wants to reuse that data and makes computation reproducibility much harder to achieve and actually check. Um, 
Yeah, and I want to um, elaborate a bit more about computational reproducibility. Um, by that we mean um, you can run the original code on the original data and achieve the same results as reported by the projects. Um, and there were a few great analyses on registered reports and publications with open data badges over the last couple of years. Um, but the results are somewhat devastating, to be honest, uh, which maybe just means it's um, it may be a lot harder to get there than we think about uh, than we think. Um, so some of the results were just uh, only about thirty percent uh, of the um, articles these uh, these projects looked at were actually reproducible. Um, the computational reproducibility depends on the skill level of the analyst, which then again uh, poses the question like how much skill is necessary until it's not computational reproducible anymore. Um, most of these uh, analyses agreed that uh, using non-proprietary uh, formats uh, helps a lot um, and providing version control. Um, so that could be using solutions like RNV, um, but also using containers uh, and like Docker, uh, for example, um, and also just simple stuff like using relative locations. Um, so uh, you um, you have to change less um, less file paths just when you're trying to rerun it. Um, and some of these were already implemented. Uh, some of these best practices were already implemented in some of the multi labs. Um, so, uh, for example, many labs too um, found a package uh, solution for their data transformations. Even though I think the um, the package at the moment could be pulled, um, so I'm not sure if it's available right now. Um, there were container solutions. Uh, a lot of non -pri non proprietary software was used, uh, and also bug trackers, which are great. Uh, just to make sure that um, the community uh, interacting with those projects is visible and um, like uh, so just so we know where people have found errors um, or deviations. Um, yeah, but this is very inconsistent um, across these projects. So, so our solution to these complications is uh, MetaPipeX. And just to break down the name uh, quickly, it's a pipeline for meta-analyses of experimental data. Um, and these make up more than 50% of the currently published um, direct replication multi-labs. Uh, and yes, the framework consists of three components. Uh, we see here on the left the standardized analysis pipeline, which provides guidance to make the analytical structure more explicit uh, and reduces documentation effort. Um, we also created an R package that matches this pipeline, so it analyzes data, it creates a standardized documentation um, for the data at different levels of aggregation. And the third component of the framework is a Shiny app, uh, which we can explore data, uh, which we can use to explore data, um, um, MetaPipe X data. That's a combination of um, replication results and meta-analytical results. And basically, it's just a GI to uh, select and visualize multi-lab analyses. So um, you can also run the analyses uh, within the Shiny app and com uh, combine different data formats. Um, it takes um, SPSS data, um, R data, and CSV files. Um, so you don't have to be able to work with R to implement the pipeline. You can just use this uh, uh, GI. And the uh, most comfortable version to apply uh, the pipeline is the full pipeline function, uh, which just takes individual participant data um, as an input, which is uh, depicted on the left. Um, and yeah, then just uh, runs the analysis and creates a full documentation of the standardized pipeline. Uh, on the right, you see the follow structure that is exported by the function. Uh, and in R, this is also provided to you as a nested list. Um, with each folder, you always have uh, the data file and, and according to codebooks, so you can make sense of um, the columns in the data set. Uh, and finally, um, what we hope MetapipeX may do, uh, we hope it will reduce effort in analysis and documentation. Uh, we hope it makes your multi-lab data more explorable. So uh, no matter if it's your own data or equivalent or simulated data, 
um, and we hope this fosters interaction between the research community and these types of projects. Um, best case scenario, it helps to make the multi-lab format more accessible to primary researchers and students alike, and it helps to develop and ask more meta-scientific questions, shed more light on questions around heterogeneity. Um, yeah, and that just adds to the meta-scientific toolkit. Um, yeah, that's it from us, uh, or from me <laughs> today. Uh, thank you for your attention, and please feel free to uh, join our SMACONF tutorial on Friday. Thanks very much, Jens. Next up today, we have James Pustyovsky and Mega Joshi talking about clustered bootstrapping for handling dependent effect sizes in meta-analysis, exploratory application for publication bias analysis. Over to you, James and Mega. Hi. Thanks for joining us for SmartConf 2023. My name is James Pustyovsky, and with my colleague Mega Joshi, we'd like to share one piece of one of our ongoing projects, developing new tools for investigating selective reporting in meta-analysis of dependent effect sizes. The method that we'll be demonstrating today is a cluster-level bootstrap for a Vevey hedges type selection model. Now, by selective reporting, we mean the phenomenon where statistically significant affirmative results are more likely to be reported and therefore more likely to be available for meta-analysis compared to results that aren't statistically significant or aren't consistent with theoretical expectations. So this happens as a result of biases in the publication process on the part of journals, editors, and reviewers, as well as because of strategic decisions on the part of authors. Selective reporting is a big deal. It's a major concern for research synthesis because it distorts the evidence base available for meta-analysis, kind of like a funhouse mirror distorts your appearance. It leads to upward biases and estimates of average effect sizes and complex biases and estimates of heterogeneity, all of which makes it all the more difficult to draw conclusions from a synthesis. Now, a meta-analyst might say, we've already got tons of tools available for investigating selective reporting. Why do we need more? We've got graphical diagnostics like funnel plots, tests and adjustment methods like pet peas, selection models, p-value diagnostics like p-curve and p-uniform. The problem is very few of these methods have been extended to handle dependent effect sizes, which are a really common feature of meta-analytic data. Dependent effect sizes crop up all over the place. For instance, when primary studies report results on multiple measures of an outcome construct or measure effects at multiple time points, or involve uh, multiple treatment groups compared to a common control group. And they also come up in meta-analyses of correlational effect sizes, where you may draw more than one correlation coefficient from based on the same sample. If you've done meta-analysis work in education, psychology, or other social science fields, you probably recognize that dependent effect sizes are really, really common. Although we have good methods available for handling this sort of dependency when conducting summary meta-analyses or meta-regressions, uh, there are very few methods available for investigating selective reporting that can accommodate dependent effect sizes. And what's more, if you use existing tools that don't account for dependency, you can get misleading results like too narrow confidence intervals and hypothesis tests that have inflated type 1 error rates. So we want to explore a rough and ready, pragmatic strategy for investigating selective reporting while also dealing with dependent effect sizes. Our thought is to fit a regular selection model as implemented in the metaphor package, and then use a cluster level bootstrap to account for the dependency. And this uses standard methods that are implemented in the boot package. For demonstrating this method, we'll use data from a recent meta-analysis by Lehman and colleagues that looked at the effect of the color red on attractiveness judgments. The data include 81 effect sizes from 41 studies. And so we've got effect size dependency issues to deal with. Here's a funnel plot of the data. A basic random effects meta-analysis indicates an average effect of about 0.2 standard deviations and a substantial heterogeneity of about 0.32. The funnel plot definitely has some asymmetry to it, so you might well be concerned about selective reporting bias with these data. Hi, I'm Mega, and I'm going to go over how to cluster bootstrap selection models. To implement a cluster bootstrap using the boot package, we need a function to fit the selection model, which takes in a data set with one row per cluster. The function also has to have an index argument, which is a vector of row indexes used to create the bootstrap sample. And then it can include any further arguments. 
Our data set has one row per effect size and potentially multiple rows per cluster. There are at least two ways to turn this into a data set with one row per cluster. We can use the group by and summarize functions to create a data set with just cluster level IDs. And then we can merge it with the full data by study to get the effect size level data. Alternatively, we can use the nest by function to nest, this, nest the data by cluster. And then we can use the unnest function to recover the effect size level data. Here's a function to run a selection model. Inside the function, we first fit a, a, an RMA uni reg meta regression model. We then use the cell model function from metaphor to fit a selection model. We don't need standard errors to be calculated in this step, so we are skipping those calculations here, which speeds things up. We then compile parameter estimates as single vector. Further, we use the possibly function from per to handle errors. By passing run cell model through possibly, we, it will now spit out NA in case there are any convergence issues or any errors when running the selection model. Here is the completed fitting function called fit cell model. First, we take a subset of the data based on the index argument. This generates a subset of the data based on resampled clusters. We use the unnest function to get the effect size level data for those resampled clusters. We then run the run cell model function here. And we include the run cell model function inside the big function here to ease parallel processing. The dot 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 here refers to the contents of the run cell model function in the previous slide. With our example Lehman data set, we create a nested data with one row per study and fit the selection model using fit cell model. These are the point estimates from the three parameter selection model. Now we can bootstrap using the boot function, which takes in the nested data set and the function to fit the selection model, arguments for steps, number of bootstrap replications, and any further options for parallel processing. Parallel processing is really useful here because we get 2,000 bootstraps in under one minute. To get bootstrap confidence intervals, we can use the bootci function specify the type of confidence intervals and specify the index of the parameter that we want. Here, the index of one is for the overall average effect size. And we get the confidence intervals for the overall average effect. Based on the selection model, the overall average effect has gone down a bit from 0.20 to 0.13. And the CI indicates that there's, a quite a, quite, there's quite a bit of uncertainty around it. Here we get the confidence intervals for between study heterogeneity and for the selection weight. So this has been a very quick demonstration of cluster bootstrapping for selection, cluster bootstrapping a selection model. This cluster bootstrapping technique is interesting because we could in principle apply cluster bootstrap to other models or methods to investigate selective reporting. We are currently studying the performance of bootstrapping a three parameter selection model and initial results suggest that the conference intervals, like the one we showed you, have reasonable coverage. Future directions include exploring other resampling methods such as fractional weighted bootstrap and turning the workflow that we presented here into a more user-friendly function. Thank you so much for your attention and please feel free to reach out with any questions. Thank you. Thanks very much, James and Mega. Next, we have Matt Lloyd-Jones, who's going to be talking about a proportionate response to comparing proportional outcomes in meta-analysis. Over to you, Matt. Hi, my name is Matt Lloyd-Jones, and today I'll be talking to you about some ways of dealing with proportion data in meta-analysis. So what is proportion data? Well, proportion data is simply data that is presented as parts of a whole. Um, so it could be proportions, percentages, or prevalences. They're limited to 0 to 1 or 0 to 100 percent. And some of the research questions you might have relating to proportion data are demonstrated here. So my one was, how does the proportion of resistant bacteria in the fecal microbiome differ between, between antibiotic treated and untreated cattle? How does proportion data typically manifest in the scientific literature? Well, typically we don't have the raw data and we're limited by what studies present. Typically studies only present proportion data in their figures. Um, some studies won't even present that proportion data directly and they'll present figures of the numerator and denominator data from which we have to calculate proportions. And then 
Alongside that, a few studies after a long, hard battle will provide raw data. And so we're left with these different levels of detail in terms of data that we have to combine into a meta-analysis. Okay, so with all that in mind, I'm going to be taking you through three problems that I came across when dealing with proportion data in my meta-analysis and the proposed solutions that I implemented in the hope that they can help you. Um, I'm going to be highlighting the R packages and functions I used in blue on my slide, so uh, keep a pen handy for writing those down if you're trying to do something similar. So perhaps the most obvious problem with proportion data is that they are restricted to a 0 to 1 or 0 to 100% range, which means they don't meet the assumptions of normality. So given that proportion data do not immediately meet the assumptions of normality, if we're going to use parametric tests for meta-analyses, then we need to do something to the data um, in order to deal with this. So, and one common way of dealing with this is to transform the data to get it into a format which more closely approximates a normal distribution. Um, and there are many options for transformation, uh, including log, logit, arc sign and double arc sign transformations and there's a lot of chatter about the relative merits of these different types and it's often confusing um, to the meta analysis which type is the best to use in their case. So which one did I use? Well I used the arc sign transformation and I implemented this transformation using the transf.arcsign function of the metaphor package. Um, so the arcsign transformation has benefits over the log or logit transformation in terms of dealing with sampling variances better and also over the double arcsign transformation in terms of back transformation and uh, interpretability. Uh, to be fair, the arcsign transformation has its own criticisms. So one of the criticisms is around its interpretability. So if you use this in a conventional modeling context, um, you can get predictions o over or outside of the 0 to 1 range. Um, but I argue that actually um, when you're using this in a meta-analysis context, um, what you actually do is you generate effect sizes first, which you then put into your models. And so it implicitly deals with this problem. And actually, if you go back to some of Cohen's early work, um, he provides even guidance on how to transform effect sizes back into approximate differences in proportions between your control and treatment groups. Um, so I argue that that's less of an issue in meta-analysis. Uh, the other argument is that uh, GLMMs accounting for a binomial distribution are better at dealing with proportion data. Um, but this in a meta-analytical context is um, perhaps less relevant because um, as I demonstrated earlier, you're often, you don't have um, the underlying uh, numerator and denominator data, you just have proportions presented, so you can't even use these methods. And there are other issues with these methods in terms of dealing uh, and model fitting with uh, sparse data, um, which we often have problems with in meta-analysis anyway. So I think the arc transformation is a good pragmatic choice in terms of dealing with proportion data. So problem two is even before you've got to the question of how to deal with your proportion data in modeling, you may not have your proportions directly presented in the paper that you're trying to incorporate into your meta-analysis. So while some studies will only report proportions, you'll come across other studies that don't report proportions at all, and they actually just report the numerator and denominator variables that would make up that proportion. And in these cases, almost always, you've only got some measure of the mean and variance of those proportions rather than individual data points. And this makes calculating the, a proportional mean and variance quite challenging. So how do you calculate the mean and variance of the proportion based on this data alone? Well, the only way of dealing with this problem that I can see is to simulate the underlying data based on those means and variances of the numerator and denominator that you do have, and then to divide them by each other in order to estimate the mean and variance of the proportion. 
And this is fairly easy to implement using base functions in R. You can plug in your means and standard deviations of your numerator and denominator variables and, de and uh, simulate vectors of simulated data. Uh, and then what you can do with those is you divide one by the other to calculate a simulated vector of proportions. And then from that, you can calculate a simulated mean and variance of a proportion. Of course, this is not ideal, but then most things in match analysis are not. And you're kind of bound to getting everything into this proportion format um, by the fact that many studies only report things in proportions, as I mentioned earlier. Um, with this kind of thing, I'd recommend a sensitivity analysis based on removing the simulated data just to check that it's not having a disproportionate influence on your overall results. And the final problem that I want to highlight is the lack of interpretability of proportional differences in meta-analyses. So by their very nature, proportions obscure what is happening in the underpinning numerator and denominator data. So the proportion of your numerator can change either because its absolute value changes or because the proportion of the corresponding denominator changes. So, for example, the proportion of resistant bacteria in a population may increase because the resistant bacteria grow and increase in number, or alternatively, the proportion may increase because the absolute value of the denominator decreases. And these obviously have very different implications in terms of interpreting what's going on in our data. And I actually think this is a bigger interpretability problem than some of those I mentioned earlier. And I, the way I propose to deal with it is to use absolute count data where it is available alongside your proportion data on which your main analysis is built. So you have your effect sizes based on your proportion data, which cover all of your studies and you've plotted and modeled those. Um, but I think you should also, alongside those, plot and model the absolute counts where they are available. And this can give you a sense of whether what you're seeing is an actual increase in your numerator or associated with a change in the denominator. So, for example, if we plot effect sizes based on the absolute number of resistant bacteria alongside those based on the proportions, we can see if the resistant bacteria are growing and increasing in number, or it's just the fact that your susceptible bacteria are being wiped out. And this can really aid the interpretation of your meta-analysis, which can be very abstract as we know. So in summary, we often have to deal with outcomes reported as proportions, whether we like it or not. Um, I proposed some potential pragmatic solutions for dealing with this data in the form in which we often encounter it when we're doing meta-analysis. Um, but of course, the real problem here is that people don't publish their data and now allowing us to fully make use of it. And the real solution, of course, is for journals, universities and funders to enforce and or reward data sharing so we can do more rich analysis. So finally, I'd like to thank the whole evidence synthesis team that was involved, not just in the meta-analysis, but the wider systematic review project. Uh, in terms of the meta-analysis, I'd like to thank Alfredo sanchez Toha, who was my uh, main meta-analytical collaborator. I'd also like to thank uh, Shinichi Nakagawa, who provided some useful email correspondence on the transformations part of this, and Dan Padfield, my colleague, who came across similar problems outside of meta-analysis and uh, sort of influenced my thinking on this a bit. And finally, here's a brief bibliography slide um, in case you want to follow up on any of the resources I presented. Thanks for listening. Many thanks indeed. That was a really interesting talk. So that closes off this session for today. That's it for quantitative synthesis part two. We hope that you've enjoyed this session as always. Keep the questions coming in via Twitter by following us at ES Hackathon. And we'll try and get our presenters to answer those over the next few hours or days. Uh, so do please keep those questions coming in. Enjoy the rest of the conference and see you again soon.